as well as panelists. And we're waiting on one panelist to join, but Anuj should be able to join. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Hi, I'm already there. So need to be elevated to the... Great. I will, <laughs> I will spotlight you then. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Urvashi, and good to know that uh, Anuj is also here. Assuming we are all set, everybody can see Anuj. Uh, this is what he looks like. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so the premise of this session is to bring together social enterprises and uh, funders for an in-person deal room that Sankalp will be hosting in December in Mumbai. After this session, uh, Urvashi and team will be reaching out to targeted social entrepreneurs from South Asia and supporting their organizations to be deal flow ready. Uh, but before all that, um, I'm gonna, I want to introduce my fantastic uh, panel to you guys. I'm going to start out, start out with, with Nisha. Nisha is the country director uh, for India for Empower. Um, she holds a PhD from IIT Delhi in sociology, MSc uh, from the London School of Economics, uh, and a BA from McGill. Uh, my second panelist uh, is Priya, uh, who is the founder CEO of 200 Million Artisans. Uh, she's ex Boston Uni. Um, and last but not least, Anuj, who's the founder CEO of CSER. Anuj has been uh, very passionate about the social enterprise ecosystem, especially in frontier markets, more than a decade, if I remember, worth of experience uh, in catalyzing impact investing for the region. Uh, of course, multi-country deals, uh, intended finance structuring, deal structuring, um, uh, carbon credits, so on and so forth. So that's, that's my fantastic panel. I have a series of questions that I want to ask this panel. How I want to run this ideally is, I have three questions for each of the three panelists. I would like the panelists to introduce their organizations a little bit before they get into responding to my specific question. Is that okay, guys? Excellent. Okay. I'm going to start out with a question to my dear friend, Priya. Priya, why does funding entrepreneurship at the first mile matter? Take it away, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, really glad to be here uh, and really glad to be part of this panel as well, speaking about something that uh, I think we all are passionate about, but uh, so am I. Um, to answer your question, let me start by introducing what we do at 200 Million Artisans very briefly, and I'm not going to try to get into the weeds of it. But uh, really why we started was, um, you know, uh, there was a, a small number gap that really started. It was a COVID response platform but the reason why we call ourselves 200 million artisans is because official figures in according to policy numbers say there are 7 million artisans, but unofficially, according to many sources, there are about 200 million people dependent on craft for livelihood. Now that's a big number to ignore when we're talking about a 1.3 billion country, which means 200 million people are out of any kind of radar, investment radar, education radar, uh, policy radar. And that is for us a critical number to ignore, um, a critical number not to ignore. Uh, but what happens when we ignore numbers like this and why are these numbers ignored is also something that we'd like to, we should understand. So when we, uh, when we talk about 200 million artisans, uh, you know, a number that came to me quite recently was that uh, in India, labor participation, and especially women's labor participation in India, is less than 20%. But official figures, according to government figures, there are 56% women who participate in the artisan sector. Now tell me if that number is not worth considering. And the reason why we are not looking at these numbers is because a lot of them, the women who participate in this sector, are women who work out of homes. They work in decentralized ways. They also are part of India's 90% informal economy. So all our structures, our investment, our, you know, everything that we're working towards is only structured for the 10% formal economy, which most of us are part of. 90% people are actually working in gig economies out of rural homes and so on and so forth. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, for us, 
you know, funding or supporting the first mile entrepreneur or entrepreneurs who are working in the first mile are people who understand these challenges, people who understand that working with women and bringing them into, uh, you know, any kind of labor participation is difficult because a lot of women can't step out of their homes. You know, they, we still work in, you know, very patriarchal ways in our country and for, the, for women to participate in uh, any kind of productive labor and to become, uh, you know, to contribute to our GDP, it means we have to meet them where they are, as opposed to, you know, expecting women to come and travel to, you know, big cities, be part of factories and so on and so forth, and then be, you know, productive, uh, sort of, you know, that's, I mean, that can't be the way to generate livelihoods for the future. And in countries like this, in frontier markets like ours, in em emerging economies where there's a very high incidence of informality, we need to recognize this. And therefore, enterprises who then navigate these challenges of informality of you know lack of social social protections lack of policy directive lack of investment have to be more than you know we have to go out of our way to support and prep these entrepreneurs and support these entrepreneurs and take them to the next you know uh, take them to the next mile or you take them to the next stage because uh, let's also what these entrepreneurs are doing and i can only speak right now of enterprises that we are working with into at 200 million artisans a lot of the enterprises uh, they struggle with having access to networks. They have struggle with having access to marketplaces. They struggle with having access to mentors. They struggle with having access to people like us who can talk to them, who can handhold them and say, hey, this is how you need to build your business. Because every funder or mentor or you know, uh, school will come and say, but where is the growth? Where is the scale? But these enterprises are really creating value in the first mile. And when I say value, let me give you a very small example. Um, uh, an enterprise like Ranga Sutra, which is a, one of the bigger enterprises in the artisan sector, has almost 3,000 artisans that are shareholders in the enterprise itself. Out of the 3,000 artisans, 80% are women. Because they started working with Ranga Sutra for the first time, they got access to bank accounts. So what we are trying to say is 200 million people do not have access to bank accounts. They are not downloading apps. They are not part of the produ productive. They're not, not only producing. I mean, one is, you know, only when you produce and you earn income, can you become consumers of the future in some ways, right? And when you become consumers of the future, you start then participating in, the, in every kind of market. And that is what I think you know, every kind of investor and supporter needs to understand that unless we uh, increase their, you know, per capita income per se, they will not, you know, we can't create meaningful livelihoods in a country like us. And I'm going to stop at that because there is a lot to be said and which is therefore why we need to support enterprises who are working with these rural communities, dispersed rural communities, and actually helping them create meaningful lives, uh, livelihoods and jobs. Uh, thank you, Priya, very insightful. Um, I, I got reminded of something that I was told very recently that rural enterprise actually self-selects the most productive women uh, in the economy. So uh, I'm, I have no, no data to back those stats, but I would love it if, if somebody could actually, uh, somebody could actually put some thought to that. Uh, a very, very quick note. There is a 15 minutes that we reserved towards the end of this panel for questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to either uh, write them down or uh, keep them to yourself so that you can bring them up towards the last 15 minutes. Echoing Urvashi, please do share your name and organization and the country uh, uh, wherever you're joining from. We are also very fortunate to have many countries represented on this panel. Uh, seemingly overseas. So that's great work on you. My next question uh, is to Anuj. And Nisha, I'm going to save the best one for the last. So uh, apologies for, for keeping you uh, down to the third question. But second question is for Anuj, which is what innovative finance structures have you seen uh, which are being used to fund smaller organizations uh, and what's needed to actually create the innovation uh, uh, by these different players? Over to you, Anuj. Uh, do also yeah. talk a little bit about Alsi, sir, before you get into responding to that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amit. So, uh, obviously, the question uh, I can only answer once I tell the background from where I'm coming. 
So, um, yeah. So I started Alcesa like way back in 2007-8 when uh, impact investing was just coming up in this country. And my first brush of impact investing was microfinance and then graduate into education, uh, renewable energy and so on and so forth. So while we have impact investing as a overall thing imploded up and we have got like good amount of impact investors, deals and other things going in. But there's a much bigger thing which we have not able to solve is that more than 95% of our whole funding, not just impact investing overall, goes to few cities, like five or six cities in the country. And it is not inclusive at all. The kind of founders we fund are similar to what we want. And there's no uh, like diversity in that whole thing. And also the way we want to have inclusive growth is not coming on the ground. And that kind of took us to the next stage of what we are doing today is uh, we started out something called Frontier Market Incubation Acceleration. And we uh, started doing place-based investing as well, uh, which mean, meant that we are going to the most underserved geographies and trying to explore not just the right kind of entrepreneur going to the next level, but also finding the right instrument to fund and also demonstrating that they will actually be giving, if not more higher than what is the in the main city kind of a entrepreneurs that we are investing, but they are not less as well. And we we actually uh, went to geographies like Kashmir, Nagaland, um, uh, Manipur, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, and others. And all these places which I am seeing, first time ever the funding was done. And in that, like obviously, uh, it was participated by us ourselves, but we also galvanized lots of other people as well. And to do that, like we had to do some kind of innovations. And this innovation is also required because if you see, we have been very much kind of pushing similar kind of structures so far. And if 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 we see some kind of a frontier market uh, kind of a first mile investing, you will need much more different kind of structures, which are also amenable to the kind of people we are talking the kind of actual positive intent we want to build in, the patient capital we are talking, and also the growth that can come together with that. And if we see that uh, in that couple of structures, I can put it across here. One was like, we, we got a kind of a quasi guarantee structures, like for uh, family friend and, and angel investor round. That was one of the small, uh, like I will say innovation, which we actually did ourselves. It became pretty successful in terms of pushing agenda in terms of Kashmir, which was like a so-called conflict zone where women are also one of the biggest casualties, if we put it like this. Conflict, women, it's a very lethal thing if we put it like this. And if there is anything which can allow these micro-entrepreneur women to kind of have their income levels increase, that's a very important thing. And for that, we need lighthouse entrepreneurs to kind of flourish and get funding as well, because funding is also a catalytical in its own nature. Second, we also found that in COVID era, and this is even today, it is uh, true, there was huge amount of dearth of capital, like suddenly the, the capital kind of kind of uh, eroded out, yeah, for, primarily for even the passion projects that we all kind of support. And in that, we got some kind of a very different kind of a guarantee structures where uh, there was foundation in Europe, which was supporting a bank in India. And in that bank in turn, then allowed uh, close to, uh, I will say, a million uh, different micro entrepreneur women to be supported through a overdraft facility as well. And their assumption was that women will be having close to 20, 25% delinquencies. But the end, uh, the surprising fact, which we all will actually will not be surprised, was that the delinquencies were uh, maximum was 4%. So that was a, actually a great, uh, like I will say, in a, enabling thing. Now, if I go to the next level, the reason first mile innovation of funding is required also in terms of a larger thing. We had been like uh, talking about similar kind of business models, which are getting funded, as I'm telling. Now, if we go to place-based investing, it also means that we are talking about agriculture. We are talking about education. We are talking about livelihood. We are talking about artisans. We are talking about basic uh, fabrics to the society. And in that basic fabrics, even though we will not have imploding of something like uh, a, 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 like a overnight success of like an internet company, but they will still be supporting large scale employment. So if you see 100 billion, uh, like 100 unicorns have become uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, com starters have become unicorns in India. And they have created just 3,50,000 jobs. I'm talking just. 
It's so less number. So if you have to create that kind of livelihood, we need to get into these frontier markets, not just in terms of uh, supporting them, but also the funding in. And the second level of funding can also come in. If we see there are other blended finance instruments, which are kind of uh, we are working and that will be kind of demonstrated uh, very soon as that, where you will see that when you are funding these entrepreneurs, similar kind of a, uh, like what we have, the convertible notes, which today we are talking about for a larger instrument that is used. They can also be used for even people who are investing 50,000 rupees each. So it could be a crowdfunded kind of a innovation, but at the same time, it is equity. It is not charity, if we put it like this. And at the same time, we are also giving benefit to the retail investors to come into startups, which so far has not been done because of the regulations and also the challenges they have in terms of trust deficit. So this is also one of the things which is coming. And then the last, not the least, this kind of a track record of catalyzing capital in these frontier market with this innovation will also allow the mainstream so-called impact funds and others to then embrace these guys. And the last, but uh, before I conclude, we don't have a tolerance of failures in this country. And that also means that when we are talking about these aspects, the majority of uh, startups, specifically in social uh, startup, if I put it like this, they die in the first two years. When I say majority means more than 90%. So what is required to sail us to the next third year? That's where we are very much keen that the funding is not just about scaling up, but also to make them confident and also to give a very clear ground by which they can go to the next third year. And that will also ensure that they have a sustainable future and also they can demonstrate that they could be profitable. So uh, that's with that, I will kind of uh, stop here. Yeah. Thanks Anuj, very insightful. Um, yeah. I have a bunch of rebuttal questions for you. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to. So I'll just, I'll just put one, which is yeah. that, uh, very recently, I was having a conversation with an ex Sidby guy, and the 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 question was that all these startups, uh, <clears throat> which are uh, on on track to become unicorns, are largely financing their uh, uh, their growth with equity. Right. However, for for the most part, our solution to user uh, our our solution to rural enterprise seems to be debt. So uh, why is it that we feel that social causes need to be financed with debt while uh, mainstream causes can be financed with equity um, uh, given, the, given the variation in risk? So not sure you want to answer that one. I don't even know if there's an answer, but- uh, no, I can quickly, quickly tell it like without taking too much of text down. First of all, the frontier market when I'm saying they do not have access to banks. Not a single bank will give them a zilch, like I'm putting it across, okay? Correct, correct. So what is the solution left? Equity. So we are hacking the system if I put it like this. Sorry, I'm <laughs> using this word. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. I, I uh, as a non-financer, yeah. who's kind of in finance, I really like uh, when we can game the system uh, yeah. to get uh, money into the hands of people who, who who need it and can do justice with it. All right, <laughs> that brings me to the question that I have for Dr. Dhawan, Nisha. Uh, Nisha, the question to you is, what are the non-financial interventions needed that can support social entrepreneurs at the first mile to access finance? Uh, and there's a, I mean, if you want the, like the, the hint takes you into kind of shared services such as accountings, but, but you don't need to, you don't need to say that. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's, it's been fantastic to, to hear everybody speak. So I am Nisha Dhavan, I'm the country director for Empower and Empower actually works with young people between the ages of 10 and 24 on education, livelihoods and health. And we do so by working with local organizations who are looking at transformative change in the lives of young people. And at the center of all of that is essentially the school to work transition. So we, we very meaningfully engage um, in livelihoods programming. Um, and India is uh, one of the 15 countries that Empower works in. Um, so I think I'm, I'm coming, at a coming at this from a slightly different vantage point to, to uh, my co-panelists. And I want to uh, answer your question, Amit, in the form of the why and then the how. So the why 
is that if we are not going to bring in young people from the margins and from the most marginalized communities, we can talk yeah, we can keep on talking about growing entrepreneurship and social and, and labor force participation rates and skilling India. Um, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and the interventions that are needed, and this is the how, I think very often, and even, even with it, within the civil society industry, within social, uh, within social entrepreneurship, we look at um, tangible, visible um, impact. And that visible impact can only be realized if we work on essential skills or soft skills. So what do we mean by that? Um, it is all of these additional inputs that are self-efficacy, building social capital, having access to bank accounts, as was mentioned by Priya, basic financial literacy, um, looking at violence, looking at safety, all of these other things that actually build the ecosystem, especially for women and girls, to be able to actively engage in livelihoods. Um, and sometimes we, we don't create the enabling environment um, and focus on the actual livelihood. Um, what happens as a result is women will be trained up and often not retained, right? So if you look at what the data is saying, um, enrollment is an issue, but what is an even bigger issue is retainment. Uh, uh, retention. Um, and how do you mitigate that? So another how is you build that enabling environment. How do you build that enabling environment? You provide inputs at the civil society level um, that will increase chances for success. Um, so I, I say this about, I was, I was asked uh, if, you're, if you need to uh, sum up your PhD research in one line. It is essentially that um, which is which is a far feat in and of itself. But um, so one of the many lines I would use is that the technical skill, right? Enabling a woman or an adolescent girl to be skilled up in a particular trade, whether it be plumbing or driving or any trade that you can think of is 30% of a training program. The other 70% is working with, her environment, with her duty bearers, um, and on herself to think about her self-efficacy, um, her control over her assets, um, her ability to navigate through social and structural barriers so she can fulfill a nine to five, she can go out to work. And when she makes money, she has control over that capital that she has made. So um, the final how is we do that with our with our local grantee partners. Because in order for this enabling environment to be effectively built, you need civil society partners who are champions of the people that you are working with. You need, um, who know the communities well, who know the nuances and the barriers well. So that's, that's the how we do it at Empower, is we recognize where the expertise lies. And it lies with adolescent girls and young women who are the people who are gonna tell us what they need to make this work. And then as the second line, we work with local organizations who then um, you know, have built up that infrastructure to be able to uh, create enabling environments in communities. So I think in, for all of this to work, um, multiple stakeholders need to come in from various vantage points. So that's why, I'm, I'm actually really excited about how this panel has been structured because I think it, it, it illustrates that very much. So thank you. And it's so cool to hear there's a, uh, I'm reminded of a little, uh, so uh, in a previous life, I used to be with Trade Suisse and we were uh, with a bunch of bankers, uh, uh, Sneha, which is one of the organizations working with the, uh, working with adolescents in, in Bombay had invited a bunch of bankers to talk to 16, 17 year old girls and boys about banking, right? Very kind of general kind of session on everything to do with savings and debt and all of that. And one of the most poignant questions which came out of that was a 16 year old girl who wanted to be a chef, by the way. I remember, uh, I don't remember her name, but I remember the story. She wanted to be a chef. And one of the most poignant questions which the bankers were completely flummoxed by was, why does one need to repay a loan? <laughs> right 
to me that was fantastic because these guys have been bankers for the longest time and really your your basic customer is asking you or whatever somebody who is representative of the next 100 million is asking you why do i need to repay your loan and really the only like logical answer to that is to get the next loan right so in, in the mind of the 16 year old if if her business skills are right if she doesn't need that next loan maybe she doesn't need to pay back the loan so uh, not trying to encourage that behavior but uh, to me that was a uh, uh, to me that was a sign of how maybe the education system has failed us where they we are we are, we are being taught a whole bunch of things but something as simple as basic banking does not feature in any of our any of our courses uh, i'm wondering nisha if if there are examples you cite from your work on uh, gender equity and financial inclusion where um access to finance or the lack of access to finance has played a role in either um uh, uh, making or breaking in a sense somebody's life um and really that is what i want to take away uh, uh, in my next conversations with anuj but over to you nisha Yeah, I know that's a that's a really interesting question, but I think it's not actually about access to credit or access to finance or access to a bank account. Um because that all exists. You you look at it on paper, um in terms of government schemes, in terms of private schemes, there it exists. It is just it is the journey from a young person's house to the bank that is the problem. And why does that happen? right it is because of it is because of structural barriers i don't actually mean the actual literal journey but it's it is a, a the lack of knowledge um or financial literacy and b um the barriers associated um with accessing it right is it forms is it is it meant for the literate is it meant for um a male counterpart who needs to counter sign right that realities even today so i think the question is one is the acknowledgement of the structural barriers that exist that limit women and girls a from accessing um credit but b even if they are bringing home their incomes holding it and actually having ownership over it okay so if those are the two issues that we need to solve for there's a lot of the solution lies in building the agency self efficacy of women and then financial inclusion will come right if we start with here is a bank account here is access to credit and we've seen this right we've we've seen this for decades if we start with we will give you a loan where will that loan go so i think the proposal is to begin from the other side right is is build up that agency so what exists can be accessed meaningfully um and what we mean by that is actual um uh, eliminating structural barriers number 2 is once those structural barriers have been eliminated um it to your story about about banking right is actually providing i always talk about it in relation to a toolbox our job in civil society is very much to build a toolbox for young people right so one of the tools in that toolbox needs to be financial literacy um that's that's step number 2 and then step number 3 then becomes very easy which is accessing that credit and and holding on to incomes fantastic um so nuanced and and, and interesting i mean i uh, i would love to keep having this kind of discussion anuj my my question to you is just just taking a cue from what nisha said um one um, one program that uh, i was part of many many years ago was when we were training a whole bunch of uh, beauticians uh, in tier 2 tier 3 india so um, young young women uh, who who were somewhat more enterprising uh, would after these beauty training programs would want to set up their own beauty parlor right so uh, imagine like a little amit beauty parlor in gorakhpur right so um uh, there is a uh, uh, so one there are already a few such beauty parlors and so now this person essentially is willing to take the risk of not seeking a job uh, but actually uh, starting an enterprise potentially becoming a job giver 
or a or a job uh, or a i mean as in a business and one of the big challenges that i realized um uh, i mean that we that we came across was the family as as nisha said the family does have access to loans so if they do want to they can go to the nearest uh, state bank of india branch whatever apply and get a loan but the family is not used to doing that for girls uh, they would much rather do that for the boy or the brother in law or the father in law whatever but this is this is a facility which in theory exists but is actually not practiced um, for the girl because i mean for the regular reasons that you know so i'm trying to figure out when you go to geographies which which are very new to not only you but are new to finance are new to financial structures how do you overcome some of these structural barriers uh, that you might uh, face and please uh, do use an example in case in case you can think of yeah so amit uh, like we were fortunate to work in 23 states on ground and uh, eight countries nearby as well including nepal uh, laos bangladesh and others so one thing i will say like while we uh, in 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 cit- cities like in metros we feel we have access to banks i'll tell you a very simple thing i was in manipur wanting to galvanize a funding and the bank refused to open up a bank account and they refused first week they refused second week they refused for first month second month third month we had the system we got the bank account opened in bombay because i was there i called the hdfc guy got the account opened here shipped the money here and wired there because it's online right and also to give a simple sense in neft if you want to do a neft transfer in all different parts of the country we do it online right it's very simple thing few seconds thing go to hinterlands go to frontier market the banks are not going to allow them even the most sophisticated banks you have to go to the branch you have to fill the slip and then on the whims and mercies or whims or the of this branch manager they will add a pay you or not so we are talking about a very different kind of they don't want to work in a different way because they want to work in their own suitable sense so what we are talking about and there is another example in saranpur i actually was working with a startup and they said and it's a us based startup and they said we want to give between 10 to 100 dollars to every artist and we working and they were 500 artists and we went to sbi bank and said please open up account or you may be having a jandan account can we do it and to our surprise first of all the jandan accounts were locked of all because they have not kind of put the minimum account they were locked and uh, we made a hue and cry that we are going to give the money uh, 10 to 100 dollars a pretty good amount and they will be getting every 6 uh, months so it's a pretty decent amount we just need the account to be uh, opened up for them they said it's too much of work we don't have time and here we are like we are talking about artists who are like waiting for and this organization startup they can't give money to them in cash because they can't get the dollars in their stack in their pockets and come to that saranpur village and give it to them so what we have to do uh, we have to go to the i went to the sbi head office here and i made it a noise and then it was possible so what we are talking about is intent which is far more important professional like us all we feel like we are sitting in a ac office and we can make things happen but it doesn't happen unless we have an intent that on the ground if we have to make it happen we have to demonstrate by using our network as well and channelizing this energy in a very positive manner and if that thing happens the first time the bank account opens there is a first time there is investment coming in if the first time the growth happens the doors are open the glass ceiling is broken so we have to at least get to that approach i am not talking about one isolated manipur or saranpur you go to any hinterlands and if you have seen the banks how they behave you will you will see that it is not something which is for faint hearted to deal with a banker to deal with a doctor to deal with a lawyer to deal with a ca all these are a nightmarish thing for a normal people and i if i go to uh, talk about the underserved population it's far more difficult and as a gatekeeper if i say in this whole country like india we have not less more than 5% cas who are the gatekeeper of any finance transaction in this country are aware of fdi and if they are not aware how on earth they will teach their startups to uh, uh, get funding they can't and without them we cannot even if the best fund managers cannot function 
So we have to have this whole thing coming into a place where we are talking about financial inclusion, then we need to make the banks being responsive. And at the same time, we have to make that they enable this whole thing going on the doorsteps of these people. Once it is done, yes, they are very smart, super smart people. They will then start uh, channelizing this whole thing for a wider use, but we have to open the gates for them. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and that's where, Anuj, I believe your teaching uh, uh, and kind of knowledge uh, dissemination uh, piece comes in. I've often seen you um, taking guest lectures and I'm assuming that is that is that part where you're trying to, uh, uh, go, to yeah. go to startups and explain to them what are the options and how they should be able to interact with the financial services ecosystem. Yeah, I think a little bit of uh, TIS also has been very much, uh, <laughs> I will say, a, a beneficial thing because because of like I, I've been blessed because of this the frontier market things became much easier to understand as well. I'm learning from it. Yeah. Fantastic, uh, uh, Priya. I have uh, yeah. so we've we've spoken a little bit about different types of organizations at different times in their journey requiring different forms of capital. Right. Uh, we've had brief discussions on this over the many months, uh, but uh, I have never actually. Uh, I've never actually seen uh, somebody create a public good around it. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to figure out maybe you want to add some light to what you're doing in that regard, uh, where you actually treat different entrepreneurs uh, differently uh, and you actually enable them to access different forms of finance depending on their need, as opposed to what's what's on offer uh, to them at that moment. Yeah, and this conversation has is getting so much fascinating as it moves along. Um, so. I realized I didn't tell people what we do exactly. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll actually tell people what we do. Uh, so basically 200 million artisans, uh, when we started out, uh, we spoke to many funders and we said, you know, why don't we support the artisan sector? There's so much impact. It, you know, meets 12 out of 17 SDGs and the, the good, you know, funding community as it were, turned around and said, oh, but you claim it. Where are the numbers? Where is the evidence for any of this? And basically that's how 200 million artisans and our vision and mission sort of uh, came about where we decided to become an ecosystem enabler, what we call an ecosystem enabler, where the goal is to bridge gaps in knowledge resources and partnerships. And as part of the knowledge piece of it, we realized that we needed to create public goods that inform not just enterprises and other stakeholders in the ecosystem, but also the funders, the academics, and the policymakers. So towards that end, we have a flagship property, a research property called Business of Handmade. Um, and Business of Handmade, uh, the first research focused on informality and how enterprises, and when I say enterprises, I do not mean nano enterprises, I do not mean only micro enterprises, I mean social and creative enterprises working in the artisan sector, and how they navigate challenges around informality, around gender, around all the systemic issues that we face. So uh, that is, please feel free, I've just shared the link in the drive, uh, in the chat. But based on that, one of the conversations that happened when it came to financing, because that, you know, all these enterprises talked about financing. Um, and currently, we are in the process of mapping the investment needs of craft-based enterprises. And perhaps this is a historical research where for the first time in the world, 500 enterprises and their investment needs and challenges are being mapped in the artisan sector. As part of this, we spoke to about 70 stakeholders, 40 of them were funders, 20 of them were uh, enterprises and then other ecosystem actors. And the one thing that kept coming up over and over again is funders kept coming to us and say, oh, but can you promise innovation? Can you promise scale? Can you promise growth? Can you promise, you know, numbers? And the enterprises kept coming to us and said, listen, we are creating value on ground. We want to grow, we want to scale, but we can't give you 10X returns. Is there a way? And with every enterprise, because the structure of the, if you're working in a rural area, the enterprise operates differently. If you're working in Uttarakhand, the challenges are different as opposed to if you're working in Karnataka, where government policies are also quite supportive, where the challenges are different. You know, artisans in the South do not are not entrepreneurial, which means they want a nine to five job and they want regular income, which means the productivity also gets impacted. Whereas artisans in Gujarat are super entrepreneurial and they'll go out of their way to create value. 
So when we are looking at enterprises, social and creative enterprises, MSMEs, who are then navigating all these challenges on ground, what we realized is that each enterprise had a very unique funding need. Some of them, and the kind of money that they're looking for as well, is could start anywhere with, with you know, as low as say $5,000 to $10,000, going right up to a million. A lot of them did not, do not know that there is, you know, something called convertible note. There is something called revenue-based financing. This is all something that we take for granted and jargon that we take for granted. They don't even know how to access working capital on most days and how much interest can they pay or should they pay? And, you know, and just to sort of do a very quick plug as it were, um, Amit uh, is also part of a series that we're hosting because we realized that there is this massive information gap uh, that enterprises needed to understand what does financing handmade means? What are the options available to them? And we are currently running a series of webinars uh, called Demystifying Finance for Handmade, where oh, many enterprises as well as investors have come and tried to break it down for enterprises. Uh, and we can't tell you how many enterprises in those communities are reaching out to us saying, we didn't even know these names existed. And we are talking you know, uh, at least about six lakh enterprises in this landscape, and none of them seem to know how to grow their enterprise. Uh, and they're working, um, they're doing amazing work on ground. There is already a, you know, a rising demand for handmade, given how Reliance and other villas of the world have come into this landscape and are, you know, acquiring companies. But where is the space for that MSME who can create value, who is creating value, who wants growth, but cannot become a unicorn and does not want to become a unicorn? Is there a language in our funding landscape, in our investment landscape, in our education landscape, where we are telling our enterprises that it's okay Okay if you don't become an unicorn if you it's okay if you don't want an exit as long as you are self sustainable that you are creating value for the communities on ground that you are not you know tanking uh, if a you know a covid hits that you are being you know uh, responsible to the people and your stakeholders uh, isn't that what we should also be telling our enterprises to do and encouraging them to do and that has been my biggest question with a lot of the funding organizations and investors and philanthropists why is it that we are hankering for scale and growth at any cost? Why is it that we can't build ecosystems, mutually you know, supportive ecosystems, where we say, hey, this needs to be done because you know, this is our country. We should all be you know, thriving in our country. Our enterprises should be thriving. Our community should be thriving. What is wrong in wanting that? Why should I be forced to scale at any cost? And I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic that you said that. I believe some of this was also for Urvashi to take to Vinny. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. But uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a fun, fun conversation. I'm wondering, uh, there is some video, Urvashi, that uh, I think you or Deepa wanted to show. If now would be the right time to show that video while the audience can think through and maybe write down the questions uh, that they would want to ask any of our esteemed panelists. That'd be great. I'm going to hand over to Splendor. Thanks so much, Amit. Thank you so much for your conversation. Priya, I have to say I'm a little bit in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> just putting that out there. I know I'm already a fan of Nisha I've just met, but um, Priya, it's a complete treat to hear you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm slightly embarrassed, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Splendor, have you got the India video? And uh, feel free to put down your questions while the video is While we're waiting, Amit, I might as well just say this. Uh, I could put down Vinit's email address and phone number in this chat. <laughs> I suggest you take that to him yourself. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the logical conclusion here is to get our panelists in front of Vinit and explain this to him. Uh, <laughs> Clearly, some of the reports that Priya has been writing, Vineet is not getting. Uh, but no, we should I don't think that I don't think it's about Vineet. I don't want to go into that bashing. Look, every, every, everything needs to exist in this ecosystem. Okay. The problem is we don't have we don't have enough space for everybody. We're 1.3 billion people just in this country. 
there is space for 50 more avishkars there is place for 10000 more like structures i mean mm -hmm. we're like one <laughs> Correct. We're not even, we're not even scratching, the, we're not even part of commercial financial institutions conversations, right? I mean, uh, look, uh, we need to do more. That's all I can say, everyone. I think let's, let's ditch the video because this is far more interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can stop sharing, I think, yeah. yeah. This is an, I think this is an interesting point about where does where do we yeah where does the where does the cap how does the capital flow and where does it come from and the demonstration of impact and so i think part of that is looking at funds like avishkar um and the work that you're doing and i think that's part of the reason for putting like bringing this session together but also the work that comes out of this session um and where we go next because that has to be the critical point so it's right. We'll WhatsApp for need. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I'll let you go. Uh, uh, what, what I meant was, there's a, to me, this is a logical fund conversation where we get we need to actually raise up uh, and all yeah. rally behind him uh, to raise um, this fund for specifically artisans and women. Uh, <laughs> and Anuj can help do all of the deals. Uh, uh, Nisha and Empower can do all of the non-financial support uh, in building agency for actually using this money well. Uh, I can moderate more panels for you while this goes on. Uh, and yeah, this is fun. <laughs> I will take that suggestion quite seriously. <laughs> Balls in your court, Urvashi. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much, Amit, for this, and thanks for the conversation. But I think we should. We had a little bit of time. We have about like nine minutes left, and maybe some questions from the audience. Uh, if they want to come in, I think I got one question from a Mamta Jain, which is about: Is it time for a socio-con or an impact con instead of a unicorn? I'll leave the nomenclature to you guys. I mean, uh, Mamta, to answer your question, I mean, there are many nomenclatures that we've heard in the last, I think, a few years. So 200 million artisans calls us, uh, I mean, we call ourselves a zebra enterprise because we align with the values mm. of a zebra enterprise, uh, which is about building mutualistic, you know, it is not about competition. It is about creating communities. It is about creating collaboration. It is about saying, you know, being able to say no when you need to say no you know you know and those are things that i think most of us are not taught when we are building enterprises but there is a community that is advocating for that but there is a new kind of enterprise which is also a camel uh, which talks about you know and there is there is reading material on that and recently hearth ventures uh, which is a new fund that has come in to support artisan enterprises or rather craft based enterprises has combined the camel and the zebra and they call it a camera so uh, we can continue new with nomenclatures as it were uh, but i think if we if we can decide that these are the values that we want to stick to and drum up support around those values and what we want to achieve i think that's half the battle one that sounds fantastic so maybe i can ask the question if that's okay um <laughs> And it's to anyone who wants yeah. to ask this question, right? And it's really this challenge that we have of uh, local capital coming in to fund this space, right? I mean, we know uh, the sort of challenges with bringing foreign funding in. I know, I know you're a big fan of FDI, but obviously that's a big challenge also. Uh, but uh, I mean, that's sorry, that's not a challenge, but it's a sort of different space. And to find that sort of risk capital that will fund this space in the local uh, ecosystem is really essential. So any yeah. thoughts from anybody on, uh, you know, how we can do that, that would be a great way to end this panel. So maybe if I say, Urvashi, so I've been in the like uh, funding industry for the last like two decades now. So uh, just to give an example, six months back, uh, I was trying to, uh, like do a transaction in Uttarakhand, Almora, for a startup. And we were talking to some local HNIs and to explain them what is a startup, what is a return they will get and other things. It was a Herculean task. And three times I went personally as well to meet them. It did not happen. 
and there was somebody in europe they took a 10 second like email uh, like read and they said yes so i we should also acknowledge that in india 95% again i will take the similar number comes from outside india because we are still not matured enough to support our own startups we don't want to because we think that equity investment is equal to debt investments so uh, people are and even in bombay many of these so called accelerators and others who are there they will put up a coupon rate of 5 to 10% on equity investments so if you have a coupon rate then let's do a debt investments rather than talking about equity so they want the best of the world but they don't want to take risks so if we have to support the early stage entrepreneurs uh, this thing has to change and that's where the much bigger thing that we can actually unlock is the retail investors coming between 50000 to 5 lakh kind of a category single investor if we can unlock that kind of thing it's a huge huge benefit which we can have for the social entrepreneurs and they love the causes as well because anyways m- most of us are giving some kind of grants why not we channelize some bit of grants i'll not say everything some bit of grants in a catalytic capital manner as well uh, so that's that's happening but still we have to accelerate the pace Thanks, Arvind. That's really what I was looking for, and that is really the white space in this in this sector. Uh, but Amit, I will let you wrap up, <laughs> uh, and unless you know, sort of Nisha or Priya wants to come into this also. Uh, there's a there's a tiny tiny uh, plug that I'll also do. Uh, one of the transactions that we are working on uh, actually tries to bring working capital uh, to a craft based organization. uh it's mostly purchase order financing uh because there are buyers at the end of this uh, uh, the organization will make money it's off farm today so it's it's an organization called industry foundation i think most of you will be familiar with that um uh, uh for us i think the most exciting part of this uh, proposition was the fact that as far as i can tell there is no other structure which which tries to bring in uh bring in climate and gender together um uh in a in a financial structure so uh, for me that was exciting uh, simply put uh, what is going to happen is uh, the the products that are being produced are actually uh, going to contribute towards net zero so you can actually measure the amount of carbon being sequestered uh, in creation of these uh, products so uh, i can obviously talk about that later in case you want to know but that was very exciting to work on um Nisha, I believe you were saying something, or was it Priya? Sorry, no. I I think we are almost on time. But one small thing that an enterprise told us very recently in our demystifying finance uh, conversations. he said uh, and I, i'll speak in hindi because he sort of communicated in hindi and it was much more powerful like that he said jab aap stock market khelte ho theek hai jab aap stock mein invest karte ho sab to equity mein nahi invest kar sakte na sab to stock day tra- trading nahi kar sakte na kuch log fir mutual fund kharidte hai kuch log fd mein dalte hai kuch log kuch aur karte hai humko bola gaya hai ki tum day trading hi karo एफडी कहा है हमारे लिए म्यूचुअल फंड कहा है बनाओ ना म्यूचुअल फंड हमारे लिए सो आई मीन टू जस्ट सॉर्ट ऑफ सम इट अप दैट यू नो इफ वी कैन क्रिएट मोर सॉर्ट ऑफ यू नो इवन फाइनेंशियल प्रोडक्ट्स फॉर एंटरप्राइजेस हु आर विलिंग टू एंगेज इन दिस लैंडस्केप ऑफ गिविंग एंड रिटर्निंग एंड सो ऑन एंड सो फॉर्थ एंड जनरेटिंग वैल्यू आई मीन व्हाट इज रॉन्ग विद दैट वी माइट नॉट गेट आवर यू नो 100x रिटर्न्स बट can we also work with 10x and 2x and 5x returns i mean you know that's still a market uh, just as microfinance was for a lot of people yeah that's true uh, nisha do you want to uh, have the final word yeah i just i i have two reflections i think um based on this conversation i think the one is what keeps on coming back is um the need to build an ecosystem you know with with several people coming from various vantage points i think that's come out loud and clear as one sort of trope of of this conversation um but i i think the other one is um 
being amenable and being agile to the needs of the people that we are working with. I feel like that's the second thing that's come up, which is we can't continue to speak the language we want to speak. Um, we have to be looking more meaningfully as at the white space, as, as she called it, or at the, um, the expressly articulated needs of the people that we want to work with. So I think those, those for me are the two major takeaways from this conversation today. That is very cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out to uh, join this fantastic conversation. I know my day is uh, looking much more brighter than what it was uh, just what an hour ago. Uh, oh, wow. We'd love to continue this conversation uh, going forward. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Catalyst uh, 2030 and Urushi for organizing this. Okay, guys. Yeah. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye. Lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.